a bond. So what we're going to talk about here is a little bit on determining the interest rate or yield on a bond, what it should be. And this is going to be more conceptual than actual numbers because we're going to talk about some of the things that an investor would have to look at or think about that breaks down where the interest rate is coming from. And we've got this equation here that you can look at that says the yield on a bond is a function of several variables. One is the real interest rate or real rate of interest. Then we have the inflation premium, default risk premium, liquidity risk premium, maturity risk premium, and special characteristics premium. I want to break these down and spend a little bit of time talking about each one of these. Let's start with the real rate of interest. The idea here is that individuals would rather spend money than save it. So in order to get people to save money, to put money away and invest for the future, we have to offer them some incentive, some positive rate of return. And that's that real rate of interest. Now typically the real rate of interest is relatively low and it varies depending on people's level of security in the system. Right now, people are more willing to save a little money because they're very concerned about what the future might hold, so they're more likely to save a little bit. Other times, they might be more confident about the overall economy and maybe wanting to spend more, and then we have to offer a higher real rate of interest to entice savings. It's also going to vary based on demographics, how many older people versus younger people are in the financial system. It's going to vary based on cultural. Does the culture tend to encourage savings or does it tend to encourage spending? All those things determine the real rate of interest. Oftentimes that's somewhere in the range of 1-3%. to 3%. Right now I would say that's probably on the low end of that range, maybe even a little less than 1%. It's like I said, people are starting to shift in the U.S. towards a more of a savings focus, at least in the short run due to their uncertainty about the financial situation. Next up we see the inflation premium. The idea of the inflation premium is that in order to keep my purchasing power I need to earn a rate of return at least equal to the inflation rate over the economy. If inflation goes up by 5% and I earn a 3% rate of return I'm actually losing money. I would have been better off spending my money today rather than saving my money for the future because I've lost 2% of my purchasing power. So investors are going to demand a higher rate of return on their investments when they think inflation is going to be higher. This inflation premium should be equal to the expected annualized rate of inflation over the life of the security that we're purchasing. So if we're purchasing a 10-year bond, we want to try to forecast what we think the inflation is going to be over the next 10 years, the average annualized rate of inflation, and add that in to our real rate of interest to start to get close to the rate of return we want on the bond. Now these first two levels that we've talked about, the real rate and the inflation premium are sometimes combined to be referred to as the risk-free rate of interest because we haven't introduced any risk factors in yet. We're just talking about how much an investor wants to maintain their purchasing power and to get some little bonus to encourage them to save as opposed to spend. Next we're going to get into risk factors or risk premiums. The first is the default risk premium and the idea of the default risk premium is the more likely the issuer of the bond is like or is to not pay us back, the higher the rate of return we want. If I'm investing in bonds from the U.S. Treasury, I know there's a high likelihood that I'm going to get the money back, so I have a very low default risk premium. Most people assume a zero default risk premium for U.S. Treasury securities because the U.S. Treasury can always make more money if they have to in order to pay off their bonds. It's not a good solution, but it is a solution that a lot of municipalities such as the states and local governments or corporations don't have at their disposal. So if you're investing in a bond from a company like Ford, uh, 
there's a significant chance that Ford might not be able to pay back those bonds. They're going to charge a little bit higher. Investors are going to charge a little bit higher rate of interest to lend money to Ford than they will the U.S. Treasury because the U.S. Treasury is more likely to pay back that money. The higher the default risk premium, the higher the yield on the security. Typically, we can use bond ratings, which are something we'll talk about in Chapter 5 with bond valuation to determine kind of an idea of how default risk premiums vary from bond to bond. Another thing to consider is the liquidity risk premium. The idea of liquidity is that liquidity measures the ability to convert a security to cash quickly and for fair market value. Investors like liquidity. If I buy a bond, I want to know that if I change my mind and I want to convert that to cash, I can do so easily and not end up losing a lot of money in the transaction. So if I buy a bond that has a value of $900 and I want to sell it today, and I find out that the only way I can sell it today is to get $850 for it, that's not very liquid. That's costing me a lot of money to convert it to cash. Or I might say, well, I can get the 900 for it, but it's going to take me three weeks to sell it. Again, that's not very liquid, and that's something I don't like as an investor. I want to be able to sell my bond for the $900 that it's worth and be able to do so quickly. Because of this, the more liquid a particular bond is, the lower the rate of return that I'll demand. If a bond is less liquid, then I want a higher rate of return to compensate me for that lack of liquidity. Liquidity varies a lot from bond to bond. We tend to see treasury bonds be among the most liquid. There's a very active secondary market for treasury bonds. So we can sell those quickly and for fair market value. Large corporate bonds and bonds issued by large municipalities tend to be fairly liquid as well. However, bonds issued by smaller corporations or by smaller municipalities may not be very liquid and investors might demand a higher rate of return for those. Maturity risk premium. Again, I'm going to reference our bond valuation chapter. One of the things we're going to talk about in the bond valuation chapter is long-term bonds are more sensitive to interest rate changes than short-term bonds. So typically we see investors want a little bit of a bonus for investing in a long-term bond and we see long-term bonds carry slightly higher rates of return on average than shorter-term bonds. That won't always be true because the inflation premium might be different over longer time periods. We might see other differences, but on average, long-term bonds are a little more risky and therefore typically carry a slight bonus or premium. Lastly, we have a special characteristics premium, which is kind of a catch-all category. One of the things we'll talk about in our bond valuation chapter is the idea of a call provision. A call provision gives the issuer the right to buy, buy back the bond prior to maturity. The bondholder doesn't have a choice in it. Call provisions favor the issuer and are a disadvantage to the bondholder. Therefore, if a bond has a call provision, the bondholder considers it to be a little more risky and wants a slightly higher rate of return. Another feature that we see in a lot of bonds is convertible bonds. Convertible bonds are convertible into shares of common stock at the bondholder's discretion. This is an advantage to the bondholder, so it's kind of like a bonus. It lowers the risk of holding the bond. So bondholders will sometimes accept a negative special characteristics premium for convertible bonds and accept a lower rate of return. So we have our risk-free rate, and then we have these other factors that measure kind of a risk premium. So each bond is a function of the risk-free rate and the risk premiums associated with that bond. The higher the risk premiums, the higher the interest rate. As a bond investor, one of the most difficult challenges a bond investor has is to try to figure out how high these various risk premiums should be for each particular bond. The better the bond investor does at determining what a fair yield is, what the appropriate interest rate, the better they're going to be at making their decisions.